Hi, Abel. Welcome to the first APAC quarterly customer meeting. Uh, how are you this afternoon? Hey, Nick. Great to have you. Super. Thanks for doing this. Um, you know, we are joined by a lot of our partners and customers across APAC. And, um, you know, we've been seeing graphs everywhere. Um, you know, we have graphs uh, across all the different countries in APAC, across verticals, on-prem, cloud, everywhere. But, you know, what a lot of us are curious to understand is how did all of this start? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And it's uh, when you look at where graphs are today, you know, at the, the, the adoption pace that we're seeing today, you know, across continents, across countries, across industries, across segments of the market, right? It, it's very easy to look at this and man, it's clearly an overnight success, right? Uh, but it's been quite a few years in the in, in the making, and, and really, so so it started way back in the days when dinosaurs ruled the earth in the late <laughs> '90s, early 2000s, right? Um, you know, in the first IT bubble, um, and I was working at uh, a small Swedish startup that I joined in between high school and and, and college, and, and Sweden at the time had mandatory military service. Right, so so I did that after high school, um, and that meant that I got out of it in like October or something. So just a few months after, you know, college started, and so I had a basically a, a lapse year. It's like, all right, now now what I do, right? And I was uh, shockingly, I was a geek already back then, right? And so loved programming and stayed up, you know, all night developing software. And then I heard about this small local company um, that was uh, looking for for developers. I'm like, all right, awesome. You know, let's let's go and have a conversation with them. And so I talked to them, and they, it, and it was great. It was very inspiring, and it felt like a really interesting thing. And just one weird thing about it, which is, they didn't describe themselves as a small company. They said they used this other weird term. They called themselves a startup. <laughs> and I'm like. What do you mean a startup? Oh, isn't there a description of us? Oh, you mean like a small company? It's like, no, 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 we're a startup. It's a different thing. It's high growth. It's fast paced. And like, all right, whatever. So I joined that. I'd never even heard of the term. Um, and that was my first foray into really into entrepreneurship. And, you know, I didn't go back to school six months, six months later. That took me several years before I went back to school um, or in back, went back, went to school, for, went to college, right? Um, but I just loved it. Fell fell in love with with the impact you can have, and and I also I you know I became the CTO after a couple of years, and um, and was uh, was really the combined CTO and VP engineering, right? So I was in my early twenties, but but had to go like get all the scars of of management, building a team, like how do you actually do that? How do you manage people who are significantly older and more experienced than you are? You know all of that kind of stuff, right? And we were we were a local startup here in Sweden, uh, but we were always had this global outlook. And and one of the things that 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 we did was that we we had interns from all over the world. Um, and one of those interns were from from India, uh, a gentleman by the name, not a gentleman by that time, a kid by the name Anuch. Um, and uh, and he and I really hit it off uh, just on a on a deep you know, personal uh, level, super bright young kid. And I was in my early twenties, so didn't have family. So we could, we could have a ton of fun and we could go partying and we could work hard and play hard and all that kind of stuff. And, at, you know, simultaneous with him being there, we were going through a bunch of technology transitions at, at the company. And, and one of the key contention points was in the database. And what we were building were enterprise content management systems. And so this is, remind, remember that this is whatever, 20 years ago. So it was on the web, it was called ASP at the time, mm -hmm. an application service provider, which we today would call SaaS. And not just SaaS, but a multi-tenant SaaS. So what that means is that we had one platform, but the customers would log on to this enterprise content management system, and they would get their own logo in the you know, and it would look like just their own content. But in reality, it ran off of one platform, a multi-tenant application, right? Right. And so what that meant, though, is that this content hierarchy was very connected. There's a lot of connected data there, and then we 
and all kinds of sophisticated features, even almost by today's standards, like visual search. You were able to search inside of content that on, on a visual, find this logo, this version of our logo, where is, which, which content is that one embedded in, for example, right? And then you had to remember the connection between that logo file and all of those PDF files, for example, or Word document. So you can just hear how connected that, that, that piece of data was, right? And then you marry that up with a multi-tenant piece, right? Where you had multiple organizations, each living simultaneously on that platform, but all believing that they just had the one system to themselves. That meant that we had to have you know, people belonging to groups, groups belonging to groups. We might have, let's say Nick. Nick is in, let's say product marketing and product marketing is a weird group, right? Because that belongs kind of to marketing and to product management. So you had that kind of this super complex data structure that we had to work on really rapidly and squeeze that into square and static tables. Yeah. And you could just feel how how weird that was. There was just a massive mismatch there. It's a square peg round hole, you know, type of thing going on. And and so we were like trying to figure out what what is what is holding us back. You know, I had about 20 engineers working for me at the time. Half of them, 10 people spent most of their time just fighting with the relational database. And this was this was really weird to me because despite my young age, I've been programming for half my life, doing a lot of kind of interesting stuff, at least I thought so at the time, right? And, and in all of my projects, the database had been an accelerator, right? It had helped me because it takes on these big gnarly pieces of storing data, make sure that it's on disk, you can query it in a powerful query language in a performant and scalable way, make sure that you can run backups online without shutting it down. Like these are really hard, you know, computer science problems. There's a big block of hard but valuable stuff that the database took over so I could focus on solving the whatever business problem was at hand, right? But for some reason, that wasn't my experience here, right? And so then we started thinking about it and, and fundamentally came to the conclusion that I think as an industry now, 20 years later, we have a very deep appreciation of, which is there was a fundamental mismatch between the shape of the data that we were working with and the abstractions, the building blocks exposed by the underlying infrastructure. And at that time we started thinking, wait, why are we just assuming the relational database, right? Yes, it's it's an amazing piece of technology, right? But it doesn't seem to be a good fit for, for this, right? And so we started thinking more about this and realized that, you know what? We should build some kind of a, like an overlay on the database, like a network engine is how we thought about it because we felt that these folders that have other folders belonging to them and other folders, right? And these kind of security hierarchies with Nick and product marketing and you know product management and what what whatever that hierarchy was, right? And the connections between them. Like if we just had nodes and then relationships between nodes and key value pairs that you can attach to, to both of them, then all of a sudden you can model this, right? And then we started looking around at other business problems we were solving. And they could all be modeled as these networks, right? And so we realized that, you know what, this is an interesting idea. And at this time, my, my friend Anuch, the, the, the engine uh, intern, was, was back in school, back, back, back in India at this time. But we called him back up and he and I and two, my, my two co-founders uh, of Neo4j, um, Johan and Peter, had been brainstorming this a lot. And we said, you know what? We're so busy keeping the kind of the, the, the ship running and pointing in the direct, right, right direction right now. And there's a ton of customer load and this is like at the peak of the IT bubble, right? And so, so we don't really have time to dedicate engineers to this, but we wanna build a prototype. And so we, we talked to Anuj and we said, y you're a smart dude. Like I'm sure you have smart friends. He was going to this, this school called IIT Bombay which is just the, this top school for, for engineering in, in, in India and probably in Asia, probably in the world actually. Um, and, and so like, you, and you probably have some smart people, right? And as long as they're smart, this doesn't have to be production quality stuff, right? We, we can sort that out. What we need is someone to help us evolve the concept and write prototype type code. And I'll be the tech lead and I'll fly over Right, and so what ultimately ended up happening was exactly that, right? So I spent a year commuting to Bombay, 
the first trip was the really formative one where um you know spent a a week week there which as a whatever 22 year old whatever i was at the at, at the time swede going to bombay was uh, was an absolutely amazing experience and and, and very very formative that entire year and especially that probably that first week and it's on that flight flying over there where i you know took that that uh, infamous by now maybe uh napkin and i was trying to figure out like what are we actually building and i was in the thick of just the the day to day of our business right which was scaling it was saas you know so it's so like a ton of just technology stuff that i was tackling kind of at home and so i didn't have a whole lot of time to think through what are we actually going to build here right and then i knew that these iit kids were wicked smart much smarter than i was so i realized that i i had to like be ahead of the game here right so but i didn't have ch- a chance to think of it before i got on that flight so then on that flight to bombay from 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 sweden is when i was like all right like i need to structure this in my in my head and the the first thing that i got was was this napkin on the on, on the flight right and so i started sketching out what i believed to be could could be a good good data model and and that was the kind of the initial kind of birth moment right and so that got us kind of nodes and relationships but that was like the the 1% or something like that just that 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 napkin it's just a it's just a very tangible example right and then getting it to 80% was the work we did you know at hotel centaur <laughs> you know in 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 bombay just outside of the iit uh campus where we where we parked out for for a week uh got a bunch of like a couple of rooms and and whiteboards in them they didn't have any whiteboards at that hotel so they had to go out and buy them <laughs> it was kind of crazy stuff like that and and we were just whiteboarding for a week and and hacking prototype stuff and that really was the the birth moment i came back a week later with 80% or so of what we today think of the property graph model beautiful and if you look at it if you connect all the dots in hindsight there was a lot of uh, elements of success there is you know uh, dealing with you dealing your school as an entrepreneur there is you know most good things start on a napkin so you know the story has that going for us uh, and there's a lot of whiteboarding right so looking back there's a lot of connections and we're set for success back then and there's also just a lot of kind of cross pollination between cultures right so for example one of the areas that we that we always played around with that you know so my 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 indian friends they they had like three four nicknames per person right it was like sandeep uh, or kapila or susmit it was called susmit one day or you know sarki the other day and that was one of the things that we actually modeled out in the graph okay there's a concept of a person his name is susmit sarkar right but he can be called susmit he could be called sarki it could be called sarkar right and so so we used kind of those kind of things right as as an example and also hindi as a, as a, as one of the as one of the languages that we that we modeled out like how do you translate the swedish word right you know like the swedish word uh for what what should i take uh, name <laughs> i'll use the i'll use that, that the one of the few uh hindi words that i know right name and then you have the concept of name and then you have the hindi word for name right or or maybe house or something like that right and so we model that out as a graph right so there's a lot of things like that that we did which i think is ultimately you know at the end of the day like how how do great ideas get get born well it's it's about taking something from one discipline and and the other right and it and it's not like you know this was new come on leonard euler like in the 17th century right like this is this has been around forever right graph theory as a discipline of mathematics right in the early 2000s when one of the hardest thing you could do in technology was get a job at google right there was all these probably not pre blogs these web pages published about like how can you get a job at google and one of the things that they always said was when you interview with google and they're going to throw like a hard problem at you your first tool should be graph theory because it's the most versatile tool right you know so so this, this it's not it's not a new concept our thing though was that you know what storing data in a database is not a new concept structuring yeah. information as a graph is not a new concept cross pollinating both of them and combining them that is a new concept right and i think that's kind of the other thing that i feel is emerging out of kind of the 
uh, the birth story, as it were. Super. And I've, I've seen, I've been here four months. One of the things that's really stood out for me is how, you know, we are present across the globe, uh, but we, we have a very, very open culture. We have a very localized yet global culture, uh, just with the right Swedish soul at the heart. Was that, was that something that was organic or, you know, did we make special efforts to keep it that way as we grew? I, I feel like for the first probably five years or something like that, like that, it was completely organic. And even even broadening it out to just generally how our culture has evolved, like the, the really the early tools that I used much more implicitly than explicitly was basically role modeling and hiring, right? I, I tried to behave that I want us to behave, generally speaking, right? And then in hiring, we screened for just good human beings. Yes, you have to be good at your job, right? But just good human beings, right? Um, and and did we always get it right? No, right? Do, do we always behave exactly the way that we should? No, right? But try really hard to live up to that the highest of our of our aspirations, right? And and that was really the the key thing that that I focused on, and then probably kind of the more more recently as the company is is truly scaling, I think there has to be a little bit more focus on more kind of explicit tools and investments in, you know, articulating values, right? Truly, what are they, right? And repeating that, like make that part of onboarding for, for new employees, formally screen for that in the interview process for, for the values, Th things like that. I, so I feel like there's there's this shift as the organization is, is growing in size from more intuitive ways in into more probably programmatic or more intentional uh, ways of, of, of shaping the culture. Great, and, you know, I, I know you know this, you know, there's a secret connection to Singapore uh, that you have between Mumbai and Sweden as well. And, you know, relationships are a part of everything we do. We are very, very partner uh, focused. We are, you know, driving customer success through the partners. So that's definitely a big thing. I know we are running short on time, ML, uh, but just I wanted to give a quick preview to what's coming up in the next iteration of the customer uh, update. And I think we have a bunch of conversations we didn't cover today, specifically graph data science. Uh, how how did that evolve along with the core DB? Um, you know, we have traditional use cases across government, BFSI, supply chain, logistics. But nowadays we are seeing a lot more many verticals adopting graph, right? Uh, so just a view uh, for the next iteration globally, what are the big use cases? And then how do you see the next 10 years of graph evolve? Uh, but I'll keep that for the next one. Uh, we'll call it episode two, uh, but really, really thank you for your time and appreciate this. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. And thanks everyone for paying attention. Thanks, Emil. Bye. Cut. <laughs>